I'm Leila Saad, and my life is driven by one burning question. How can I become a good ancestor? How can I create a legacy of healing and liberation for those who are here in this lifetime and those who will come after I'm gone? In my pursuit to answer this question, I'm interviewing change makers and culture shapers who are also exploring that question for themselves in the way that they live and lead their life. It's my intention that these conversations will help you find your own answers to that question too. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Diego Perez is the writer behind the pen name Young Pueblo. Young Pueblo means young people, and it serves to remind Diego of his Ecuadorian roots, his experiences in activism, and that the collective of humanity is in the midst of important growth. Diego is a meditator, a poetry and prose writer, and a speaker who has over a million followers on Instagram. His first book, Inward, explores the movement from self-love to unconditional love, the power of letting go, and the wisdom that comes when we truly try to know ourselves. His newest book, Clarity and Connection, focuses on understanding how past wounds impact our present relationships and guides readers through the excavation and release of the past that is required for growth. In this uplifting conversation, Diego and I explore his self-healing journey through meditation, his path as a writer, and his thoughts on personal and collective liberation. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Good Ancestor Podcast. I'm your host, Leila Saad, and today I have a very, very special guest. I am in conversation with Diego Perez, also known as Young Pueblo. He is the author of the book Inward, which I have here, and his new book, Clarity and Connection, which comes out this month in April 2021. And he's just an incredible source of light and hope and wisdom um, with his platform and Instagram and his books. And I'm, I'm so happy to be in conversation with him today. So welcome, Diego. Layla, thank you so much. I feel like uh, it's such a joy to get to have this conversation with you. And I've been following you for a long time. Likewise. Um, so <laughs> I, think it, I think it's been, I would say over two years. So oh, wow. I've been, I think I've been watching your journey through and through and have just felt so much uh, just sympathetic joy for your success and have really, I don't know, I feel like to be able to really dive into both areas spirituality and the reality of this material world which mm. includes you know all of the beauties and all of the institutional harm the structural harm that we have to deal with and being able to just hold the two together and not mm. divide them it's just such an inspiration oh thank you that means so much to me that means so much to me I have so much respect for you and um people whose work is in the world of spirituality or personal healing um, hold a very deep space and loving space in my heart because that is the that is the place from which I entered into the place that I'm in now, the work that I'm in now. And right. I definitely see them as being <clears throat> inherently interconnected. And the way that I see you talking about these issues, both from, you know, the, the ethereal, the spiritual, the, the heart work, the soul work, and the institutional, the activism, it, there's just this... Um, it, they go together hand in hand and you weave them together so beautifully. And I especially wanted to speak with you because of the times that we are in. And I'm sure that you're having a lot of conversations with many people. I know many people come to your Instagram page for that um, respite from the chaos <laughs> of the rest mm -hmm. of the internet and, <clears throat> and, and social media and media and what's happening in the world. Um, and, and, yeah, we're going to get into all of that in this conversation, but I want to start us off with a, a, a very first question, which we ask every single guest, who are some of the ancestors living or transitioned familial or societal who have influenced you on your journey? I think um, that the ancestor that I most have in mind lately is my uncle Antonio, who um, he passed away in April, like in the first wave of the, oh, wow. of the coronavirus hitting South America. So at the same time that it was 
really, so I was in New York City when that first wave hit and we got to see like the brunt of how intense this um, pandemic would be. Um, but at the same time, it was hitting where I was from in Ecuador and Guayaquil. And it just, you know, it just took him away very quickly. And I think for me, you know, he was always some, somebody who was uh, a very compassionate person in our family and someone who was literally a hero. He was a firefighter. Um, he was captain of the firefighters in Guayaquil and he just saved, literally saved countless lives. Like there would be pictures of him and newspaper clippings. Like when I would go visit him in Ecuador, he would show me these clippings of him just like going into these buildings that were just like raging fires would be coming out of them. He, he, he would go straight into them. And um, his, his sort of the way that he would carry himself, the way that he would be there for our family members in times of need, um, I, I hope to be able to, you know, step into his shoes in some way as I grow older and, um, and be there for, for my family members in a similar way. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm so sorry for your loss, but I really appreciate the way that you, that you spoke about him. And the word that really comes out for me is, is courage as you, as you're speaking about, mm -hmm. you know, him rushing into those buildings and being, um, being willing to put himself in, in the literal firing line um, in order to save others, in order to help others. Um, I'm wondering you know, when you think about your journey and the work that you are doing both in, in, internally inside of yourself and then what you're sharing with the, with the rest of your world, with the rest of the world, when you think about the word courage, what comes up for you? Um, especially in the beginning, right? When I first started just like turning my awareness inward and, um, and starting you know, to stop that constant running away. Cause I was stuck in this cycle of just like, whenever I would have difficult emotions, whenever I would, I would feel pain or anxiety or sadness, I would just try to run away into the arms of pleasure and just consume myself with, you know, either attention from other people or spend time doing drugs or just doing something to get away from myself and just like dull all the intensity that I was feeling inside it took a lot of courage to start that process to just mm -hmm. literally just be with myself to just sit with myself. And this was before I even started meditating to just pay attention to what was happening inside without running away. Mm -hmm. um, and especially at that time, this was before that, this wave of self-love, this wave mm -hmm. of wellness, this wave of like, I'm talking, you know, 2011. Um, Cause I remember self-love becoming really popular around I'd say like 2014 to 2016, 2017, mm. It, mm. it became like a really big internet conversation um, where people are trying to define, you know, what is self-love? Is it real? Is it worthwhile? Should I activate this in my life? But um, back in 2011, this all felt very new to me. And especially coming from my background, um, you know, like I was born in Ecuador. I come from a very poor family. And um, we, we emigrated to the United States when I was about four years old. And it felt um, you know, nobody had time to deal with their emotions. No one had the, like the, the time and space to do that. So I, the only reason I did was because I, I, I felt like I had to, or else I was going to have a very early death. Mm. So you, we, we, when we introduced you, you know, I said, your name is Diego, but you are known as young Pueblo. Um, and unless someone has seen you in a conversation, they may not necessarily know that your name is actually Young po uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, is actually Diego Perez and not Young Pueblo. There's right, a yeah. um, very much a focus for <clears throat> you. What I witness is very much a focus for you to kind of decenter yourself, the person, and really push forward the the words and the the work, the the energy and the reflection, the wisdom for people to to engage with. But there's a real person behind all of that who is not just you know, a wordsmith who's able to put together words that just flow together and read really well and make you think, but someone who's gone through their own process. Um, and you've just started telling us a little bit about what that is, what that journey has been. I'm wondering if you can fill in the gaps um, for us about how your journey began. What were some of the things that you were coming up against and who was it or what was it that sparked the journey inwards? Um, to mm -hmm. get you to where mm -hmm. you are now, because it sounds like, and it's not surprising, 
it sounds like, you know, there was really a dark night of the soul there. There was something mm. that really you were wrestling with for some time until you had to have that come to, come to Diego moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th there was a lot that happened. And I think it all just built up over time. Like for mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, you, you function relatively well as a child, but then there are things that keep accumulating over time. And if you don't deal with them properly, then they just become bigger and bigger patterns and they start just taking over. Um, for me, it was really, you know, I was born with an inclination towards uh, like a quiet sadness that I would keep inside of myself. And it, it doesn't really necessarily have a source. Like it might've even been a chemical imbalance or something like that, where sometimes I would just feel, you know, like I would just feel this kind of lingering heavy sadness that um, I couldn't quite put a name to. But then over time with the situations of my life, um, that all grew. When we got to the United States, when I, like I mentioned before, when I was four years old, my family was incredibly poor. So my mom, she worked uh, cleaning houses and my father worked at a supermarket. Mm -hmm. So they, they worked incredibly hard and still we struggled so much to make ends meet. And all of that tension that um, was like sort of structurally placed on our household because um, it was my mom, my dad, my brother and I at the time, my little sister was born a little later um, when I was about 10 years old. And seeing, you know, my, my parents, they love each other incredibly well, but they were forced into a situation where like, there was just this constant, constant struggle, this constant lack of money. And, um, and it pushed their relationship to the edge. And mm. even though they loved each other, um, you know, they'd be fighting all the time, because they just didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to um, get out of this cycle of poverty that, you know, like, America just kind of like lands you in if you're not, mm -hmm. if you're not, if you don't already already come from means, you know, you're gonna, it's gonna be a, a very serious struggle. Um, so it wasn't until my brother and I both became older, and we started working. Um, and we were able to start taking care of ourselves. And we both started working really young. You know, I, I got my first job when I was like 13. And he got his when he was, I think, also like 13. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to take some financial pressure off my parents. And it was interesting, you know, like literally their situation was like their fights were fights caused through structure. It wasn't because they had the real relationship problems. So like right. the more that um, their financial situation was alleviated, the more harmony there was between the two of them. I mean, you could oh. look at them now, you yeah. know, because my brother and I and my sister are adults. We're taking care of ourselves. We're, taking, we're helping taking care, take care of them. And they're just like phenomenally in love, you know, and they still have their up, ups and downs, but it's just not the way it was before. Mm. Um, so it's interesting to watch that play out and see how much um, psychological harm poverty can do on a person. Absolutely. I think for, yeah, yeah. I think for me as an individual, it just like, it caused such a, um, a growth of scarcity in my mind where I became uh, like through fear, I became quite greedy, quite attached, um, really self-centered in some ways to so just like focus on like, how can I get what I need? Um, but just cause like, that's, that's all I knew was scarcity. Right. Um, and, and it's a survival tactic, right? It's a, right. it's a way that we're trying to save ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And it just, it continued manifesting like over my teenage years and uh, on the on the external level, I was always very like gregarious and outgoing, and I would talk to people a lot. But internally, in my mind, it was just like this constant kind of, um, you know, how can I survive? How can I figure this out? Um, <clears throat> and uh, when I went into college, it all kind of snowballed into, you know, being kind of oblivious to these inner workings of my subconscious and how much I had accumulated over time, and how sort of. Uh, you know, unsafe, unsure, and how um, anxious I would feel all the time. And then I just started developing these really nasty habits. You know, I started partying all the time. Like I would go out all the time. I would go out probably from, from like Wednesday to like even Sunday, like we would just invent reasons to like drink and, you mm -hmm. know, consume more intoxicants. Um, and it, you know, I met some great people in college and it wasn't, it wasn't all a terrible experience, but um, my habits definitely remained blind and they did not um, 
didn't lead me anywhere good. So when I ended up finishing school, um, I was just incredibly, incredibly unhealthy. And it pushed me to a point where I was so unhealthy that my heart felt like it was just so weak. Um, and it mm. went to a point where I, one night I just had consumed a bunch of drugs again that night. And, um, I f- was on the floor and I felt like I was having a heart attack. And I just mm. felt like I was like my, you know, like my, like my life was on the edge. And I, I did end up talking to a doctor later who told me that I probably did have some mild form of heart attack. Um, and when I was on the floor, you know, basically like praying for my life. Uh, what I kept thinking about was my parents, you know, I kept thinking about them and how much they sacrifice for me to have a better life and how they put themselves through even more struggle to come here um, so that they can have the opportunity for my brother and I and my sister to have, you know, something better than they had. Mm. And I felt like I was wasting that opportunity. And for some reason, that was a particular you know, um, the thing that really just energized me into even starting this self-love journey, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why I, I took, took the drugs, I flushed them down the toilet and, um, and I just started by, I just doubled down on radical honesty and I started some serious positive habit building. And it was all very small in the beginning, you know, like literally mm-hmm. as small as like going, going for walks and, you know, being really intentional about the food that I was eating and, and not making any gigantic changes, but small changes to the point where I was slowly feeling healthier in my mind and body. Wow. Um, thank you so much for sharing that Diego. And as you were speaking, I mean, I just resonated so much with it because I had minus the drugs, very similar experiences to you Mm -hmm. Um, throughout that period. um, University was really hard for me, even though it didn't look like it outwardly, because I was partying so much. (laughs) When you said that, I was like, that was me. I was always partying. Um, But it was because, you know, coming home at night, it just felt like I cannot be with myself. I don't, you know, I would be in a very dark place when I was by myself. Um, And even though, you know, I'd be surrounded by so many people when out, I just felt completely outside of myself and completely alone. Um, You know, for me, what got me started on the journey towards changing my life was having a best friend who was on his own journey of personal development and personal growth. And he introduced me to books and different mindsets and, um, tapes right like cds and stuff at the time um i'm wondering what was the spark for you that you know made you think i need to start with radical honesty where did that come from that's a really good question and for some reason it feels rather ambiguous right Mm. it's like unclear i think in my mind like i was never um I, i was never pointed in the direction of like spiritual writing or anything like that at that moment all I knew was that a certain series of actions had led me to this point and Mm. now I need to do the opposite series of actions (laughs) to get myself to a better point and what was very clear in my mind was that I had spent you know a number of years like seriously lying to myself and if I'm going to like and all of this lying had brought me to this point where I would lie to myself about like what, you know, those dark moments that you would talk about, um, I would feel them and I would just either hide from them or Mm. ignore them or make, or like downplay them. So my thing was, if they come up, be with them, don't run away and just, you know, don't, don't like reach for marijuana or don't like do something to, to try to quell whatever it is that's bubbling up inside. Um, and I think that's where that, that idea, you know, I didn't invent the term radical honesty, but that's just the way it, it, um, played out in my life. Cause I was like, man, I was intensely lying. Now let me be radically honest and see what happens. Yeah. Um, you know, that just, that takes such a level of self-awareness, even, even from that place, um, to be able to say to myself, I have been lying to myself, um, 
I have not been honest with myself and I'm, I'm going to start telling myself the truth. When you first started practicing that and being with what was coming up, um, what was that experience like for you? And how did you, how did you stay committed to it when it got really hard? Yeah, I think the the experience, you know, it started really <clears throat> like illuminating not just my interactions with myself, but my interactions with with other people. And what I what started becoming quite clear was how I would get caught in these like performative like relationships with my like with my mom, with my dad, with my brother and my sister, mm. and I started seeing how even the, the relationship I had with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Um, all of it was just really surface level and all of it, you know, I felt kind of because we had been doing these particular actions to each other for such a long time, it just like everything was kind of stale. Mm. Um, so I remember like one moment that really stands out to me was the moment when I realized that my, my father has a particular way of showing his love for the family. You know, he had an incredibly difficult childhood and you know, even much harder than mine. And he um, loves us so much, but he shows his love and it's like sort of, you know, old fashioned way where he will like work really hard for you. Mm. He will, you know, give you rides to the things you need to do. And he, but he won't, he's not often telling you that he loves you or he's not, you know, always hugging you or anything like that, but he, right. he's going to be there for you when you need him. Um, so I, I, but I knew how much he loved me. So I was like, you know what? Like, let me switch the game up and let me give him a hug and let mm. me like hug him. And like, you know, he's like a strong like guy. And I remember just like catching him off guard and, and just like hugging him and just like telling him I love him. And the moment that I saw that if we're in a play together and we're always acting the same way, mm. if I take it upon myself to put out different lines and act in a different way, then the whole play changes. Right. And I started doing that within my interactions. And I started just, you know, with, with my girlfriend, with my mom, my dad, with my brother, and just started, because the moment that I started really being radically honest with myself and started, um, you know, practicing these positive habits, like it's so quick that love starts bubbling up and you start mm. feeling like, you know, more gratitude and more, um, I don't know, that that's something to do with bringing more presence into your life, but it just... I was just, you know, allowed to share that love with the people around me and try to be kinder. And it made a big difference, you know, in my family. And I think to this day, now we, we have a better, um, I don't know, it's like we all grew up emotionally together. Right. Yeah. It's really incredible when this is what I found in my own journey. Um, we're waiting for our parents to be the parents that we think that they should be right yeah, they, they yeah. should act like how we think they should act but we stay the same and how things do change when we say actually i'm i'm going to change things and see and see what happens um i've definitely seen that in my relationship with my with my parents as well and it you do feel like you you grow up together and you start to appreciate the fact that oh they're human just like me they're just they're just trying to figure it out too and totally. they have their own traumas and their own things they have their own stuff that they're working through much of which happened before i was even here right um and and having that that sense of compassion so is in doing that work is compassion something that has come come up to the fore for you and how has it changed the way that you are in relationship with yourself and the way you are in relationship with other people? Yeah, compassion has been huge. I think one thing that I try to practice really often is if I'm in a close relationship with someone, you know, one of my like close friends or family members, and if there's a need to tell them, you know, a hard truth, like first I would examine myself, like, is this coming from a, a good place or mm. is it coming from like my inner tension that's seeking to project something? Am I trying to control them in some way? Or is there something that, you know, that I actually need to tell them versus just like wanting to tell them out of my own craving? Mm. Um, and when I do see that, oh yeah, you know, I should let this person know X, Y, and Z, I make sure to tell the truth as compassionately as possible. You know, you don't want to like 
like just bombard someone and throw something on someone really heavily, especially if it's someone you love, but to be able to meet them where they're at. And I think that's one of the the biggest aspects of compassion is, you know, trying to meet someone where they're at Mm. can be incredibly difficult, but Mm. it's one of the, one of the most effective ways to hold their hand and bring them forward and help them see a new perspective that can help both of you, you know, have a better relationship, especially on the one-on-one level. I love that you talked about checking yourself first though, before. Totally, right? totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> checking, what are my intentions here? You know, what am I, what am I actually trying to achieve here? Is this for them or is this for me? Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think, I think there's also an aspect of, I can't meet people where they're at if I'm not with me where I'm at right now. Totally. Yep. Mm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you, you've talked about the fact that, you know, you're a meditator, not a meditation teacher. Um, I want to talk about why that's so important for you to make that distinction and also your journey um, in being a meditator. In other interviews, I've heard you talk about your um, teacher, SN Goenka. And right. yeah, and sort of the, the path, the, the, the Vipassana meditations that you've been doing, the fact that you meditate for two hours every single day <laughs> at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Um, That's right. Tell, yeah. tell us about that. I'm so fascinated. Yeah, um, I think it's, you know, it's another story that feels, I can't quite pinpoint the actual source of like where this feeling came from. Because I, I honestly, like I've, I've heard about meditation my whole life, just like everybody else. You know, it's mm-hmm. always there in the background. Someone's talking about it. But it wasn't until one of my friends, um, one of my really good friends, one of my best friends, he he um, was traveling and he ended up being told about it when he was in India. This really nice family told him about it and he ended up signing up. And this was someone that I had, you know, spent a lot of time with, done a lot of stupid stuff with. <laughs> and and he, you know, he writes me this email. And he's like, to me and a few other friends. And he's just, it's, uh, you know, he just talks about love and compassion and goodwill over and over in the email. Mm. And I was so shocked by what he was saying. And when he, when he described the situation, you know, 10 days of silence, meditating, you're meditating the whole day, every day when you're there. And he was describing how much he felt better and how much he had gotten and how he felt like he found his, his path. I knew from that moment, I was like, whatever he did, you know, I don't even get what he did, but I need to try it for myself because that sounds right up my alley. Mm. And, and can I ask, where were you in your journey at that time? Like between Mm -hmm. kind of the, you know, the doing the radical honesty and sort of, you know, changing your habits um, between that and starting the meditation, where were you at? I was, I would say about eight months after I started oh, wow. um, like radical honesty and positive habit building. Um, Look at that. It was, yeah. So it was yeah. really the perfect time where I had become kind of like mentally strong enough and had spent a lot of time, you know, building my self-awareness and just like building myself up from the, from the ground up. Um, and I knew that I was getting a lot from what I was doing, but I, I was ready to take a, a deeper step. Um, and it just, it just connected so well inside of me that I, um, I signed up immediately after he told me about it. And I, I ended up doing my first course, um, the summer of 2012, which is basically Mm. almost exactly like a year after I had my, you know, my like rock bottom moment. Wow. Um, and, and it was, it was incredibly powerful. It was you know, to this day, like the memories of that course are so sharp because it was just so difficult. That mm. first course was just so <laughs> incredibly difficult. Like I, um, not only was it giving me a whole different worldview, mm. um, cause at that time I was still in the, like pretty deeply in the activism world. And, um, and I was, um, an active organizer and, and just, you know, I, I understood liberation from one context, from a context of meeting people's material needs. Mm. And, um, you know, literally the work of like undoing oppression, undoing systemic harm, and trying to just build a better world that actually respects all of humanity. Nice. Um, but then this gave me the context of internal liberation, which was like, 
the liberation of like how much of this suffering, though there are people obviously in the world who, who are committing harm and are, could be harming you, but there's also a lot of harm that you're causing yourself. Mm. And a lot of that harm being driven by your own cravings or mm. your own ignorance, you know, your lack of understanding of what's happening inside of you. Um, so given, given this like internal dynamic of liberation, it was literally like, it was blowing my mind. And I remember like, you know, not only am I meditating, but then at the, in the evening we would have these uh, like hour to like hour and 10, 20 minute discourses of Goenka. And he, you know, I learned so much from him in 10 days that I remember the only way that I could conceive of it when people would ask me about it was, I felt like I learned more in 10 days than four years of college. Wow. Like I got so much from the direct experience of just observing the truth within my body. And from, you know, just understanding that like, wow, like it, at, at an ultimate level, I am causing a lot of my pain mm. and I do need to take responsibility for my happiness. And if I do that, then, you know, I could live a life that's much more full of creativity, much more full of mental clarity. And I can be like way more effective in all of my endeavors. Mm. Oh, wow. Uh, yesterday I was, um, I, I had Googled SN Goenka to find out more about his work and something came up mm. with um, some of his quotes and I was reading them and I was like, this sounds just like Diego. Like, this is the same wisdom. <laughs> like he really, you know, he really internalized um, th this study, right? He really, like, he really went in there. Um, I love that you brought up the fact that, you know, you had prior to embarking on this journey into being a meditator, you had been, quite active as an activist, um, mm -hmm. you know, your heart is an, is an activist heart, but it was from that one particular lens and how this um, journey, which was about, you know, the self actually helped you to understand activism and, and liberation from a completely different lens, but one that I believe is so important for for sustainable change and for exactly right for change mm -hmm. that um because so many people get burnt out through activism so many people end up um using the very same tools of oppression that they are trying to fight not conscious yes. right yes. not yeah. not not from the intent of trying to but because there is that um there is no other framework um, and, and this sounds like it, it opened up a whole other world for you to be able to draw very deeply from. So I'm wondering how that changed how you showed up in activism afterwards, what changed? And as you're looking at the world that we are in today and the important activism that is taking place, what do you think is really important for activists to understand in order for them to really take care of themselves and to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, create healing for themselves and, and as we work together to create healing for, for one another. <clears throat> well, well it, <clears throat> sorry, I did a lot of things. <laughs> I, um, so I did a few courses while I was still really active. I was part of this group called Youth Against Mass Incarceration um, that was active in Boston. And at the time I, you know, I understood how much power people can have. Like pe mm. people come together, we can change whatever we want. And, and I've seen that happen over and over. Um, but what I did notice even before I started meditating was the, how it wasn't sustainable, how quickly either historically or on the like, you know, local level, I would see exactly what you mentioned that if you remain unaware of yourself, you will quickly reproduce the thing that you hated. Um, and it becomes like a very dangerous thing. And so there, you know, there's so much infighting and so much yes. um, unnecessary, like empire building, as opposed to coalition building amongst yes. different groups. Um, but what it did for me was it gave me a context to work inside of like I, at the time I was, I remember reading, I read um, Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. And then right after I read the autobiography of Asada Shakur. Mm. Um, and that, and this was like this, like if it, it felt so similar to my transition 
and how I understood the world and how I understood myself. And I felt like I was landing um, like in the lap of Asada, you know, mm-hmm. like she, she understood, especially like those last few chapters of her book where she puts out her global view and, you know, is really one of the first people to, well, the first people that I know of to call for movement through love. And that was, to me, that was really something that's missing. And love is not only an active medium that you can use to change the world, but it's something that is regenerative. So that if you're loving yourself through this process, you're going to just be able to make way better decisions. And the problems that we face, they're going to require a lot of creativity. But to be able to access that creativity, you're going to have to go through a deconditioning process so that you're not acting from a place of survival, so that you're not acting from a place of human habit, but you're Mm -hmm. acting from a place of actual human nature Mm -hmm. so that that creativity can just flow abundantly and your mental clarity can just be so sharp. Mm. I love this conversation so much because I think, you know, these, these last couple of years that we've been in are, you know, the, the collective challenges that we're facing are really ramping up and really asking us to really be discerning yeah. and intentional, Massive. Yeah. right, yeah. about how we show up. And for me, what that mm. has looked like, especially this year, is... I don't want to do all the things I want to do. What's really essential and what's really important. Um, I've been taking, that was, things, yeah, I've been taking, that, that was, that was plate. literally, <laughs> that was literally my promise to myself too, was like, do less things and do those yes. less things really well. That's exactly what <laughs> I told my team at the beginning of the year. I said, we're going to do less things, but the things that we do, we're going to do them really, really well. Um, because I want to be intentional intentional about how I spend my time, what we create and what we put out into the world. Um, there is a feeling and it's, it's not just a feeling it's a, it's a requirement that change is needed and change is needed. Now there's an urgency that is required, but at the same time, I think when we move from that sense of, um, urgency, that's not, um, grounded, that's when we begin to replicate some of those harms that we're not meaning to, but we are, beca- but we're doing it because we're not taking the time to do the work inward. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say thank you to you for really like modeling that and affirming. Cause when I see other people doing, it, I'm like, yes, okay, good. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. thank you. Thank you too. It, it thrills me that we have come to such similar conclusions. Absolutely. I think it's so important. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I want to talk about your books now. So Inward, which you originally self-published um, mm-hmm. and then later has been published by Andrews McMeal Publishing. Um, and so is your second book as well. And I know that this is part of a trilogy series, yeah, that's right. which is very exciting. So can you give us the overview of um, inward, how it started, and then the trilogy and what, what you're wanting to accomplish with it. Definitely. Um, so I, you know, even to just keep going from the conversation that we were having, like when I started really, um, delving deeper into meditation, I would go to a few of those 10 day courses a year. Mm. And, um, and I kept, you know, I just kept getting such a big, you get a big return for the effort that you put in. And does it get Um, easier? Um, or is easier, not the right word. (laughs) Yeah. I, you know, it's not because there's a lot in there. You'd be surprised how much we've accumulated as individuals. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it always remains challenging, but you do figure out how to practice better Mm. and you do figure out how to like ride the waves and the ups and downs within the retreats better, you know, so your, your level of reaction, it decreases, Mm. it doesn't become as intense so that if you have a hard moment, you can just accept I'm having a hard moment right now, as opposed to like, not only are you have, have, having a hard moment, but then you're going to throw a bunch of fire on top of it right. and make it a worse moment. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but when I really started digging deep into meditation, it just, it hit me so hard. And, you know, and this is where like the name Young Pueblo got its meaning. And um, it hit me hard that humanity as a whole is in a transitionary period where we're maturing. Um, And I always like to give that example of, you know, what teachers try to teach us as children. Um, Like when we were first entering school, you know, just the simple basic fundamentals of, you know, you have to, you should share, 
You mm-hmm. should treat each other kindly. You should tell the truth. You should not hit each other. <clears throat> and generally just being you know, good to one another. Um, these are fundamentals that humanity as a whole has not mastered at all, right? We may be able to do these things as yes. individuals, right? but these like essential core things of like how to be a proper human being, yeah. um, we, we need to master them. So when, when that became clear that humanity was maturing, like the name young, young Pueblo literally means young people. And to me, humanity as a whole is very young. And we're in this, you know, especially in this hundred year period where we have these massive challenges, you know, like structural racism, patriarchy, we have mm. climate change. We just got, we, you can just go on and on. We have these right. massive challenges, right. um, but through challenges, there is the opportunity for maturity we can grow up um and not only that people are taking it upon themselves to to do that inner work in a way that's i think historical like that that's just unprecedented there are people who are you know all over the world it's kind of it's one of the like there's been so many negative effects to globalization but i think this is might be one of the few positive effects of globalization where because the world has become so deeply interconnected um the healing modalities that have really been effective for different people, they are now just more widely accessible. We can, we can go much further in regards to accessibility. Yeah. Um, but there are, you know, from like Western therapy to like Eastern forms of meditation and you can just, you know, indigenous practices, you can go on and on. Mm. And if you go into each one, obviously there are problems with each one and the way they're treated in the Western world. Mm. But generally people are trying to find their means to go inward in a way that's just more effective than it used to be. Um, So to me, when I started writing, I wanted people to just know that healing was possible. You know, I didn't want to tell them how the healing would work for them, Mm. but I just wanted to give them reflective material so that they can start understanding themselves better as they're moving through their own process. Mm. And that's really what kind of gave, gave uh, inward life, because to me, if you can, if you can love yourself a little more, if you can understand yourself a little more, then you're going to be less likely to harm other people. Right. So this is like a fundamental thing as human beings, like you should get to know yourself. And not only will that make you happier but that will make you a kinder human being and we need more kind people. Yeah. And so how did that tell us about the, the trilogy, the trilogy of books? Yeah, I just, yeah. so I was just, uh, you know, letting people know about that when I yeah. started releasing Clarity and Connection. Um, but I do want to, I want to put forward, so Clarity and Connection is that next step from inward where you, we continue, I continue talking about personal transformation but then I want to really give a strong focus on relationships, like, Mm. and that being like friendships and intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I do feel that if we're able to treat each other in our most local environments, if we're able to treat each other well, then Mm. like it's those interconnections that build the building blocks of society. So as you know, like so much harm happens in the home. And if we're able to, remedy that if we're able to improve our ability to communicate improve our ability to actively support each other's happiness if we're able to do that from a wise place where like i understand that i can't make you happy but i do understand that i can support you in your happiness and i can actually you know help you through your own healing process and just be there for you and Mm -hmm. likewise you could do the same for me so if we're able to build a much more uh, compassionate web where we can treat each other better and catch each other if we fall, then I think that will be sort of like that next step because personal transformation is the beginning. But then after that, it's how are your connections? Right. You know, how are you dealing with them? Yeah. And, 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 um, and what will the third one be about? The third one's going to be about community. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to just keep sort of stemming outward mm-hmm. and I want to, still maintain that vibe of building self-awareness and personal transformation. Cause at yeah. the end of the day, that's like that, that's that key fundamental building block, exactly. but then just start talking more about, you know, how can we interact with each other in just more fulfilling ways and um, keep, keep sort of like going outward from there 
And I, pre- I really appreciate that model of it starting from the personal first and that always being the foundation because that's definitely what I found in my own journey. And I think I've always felt from a very young age that I wanted to do work that was about changing the world in some way, right? And it's this, I'm going to help the world. I'm going to save the world, right? Um, but, where, but where things really started, you know, um, be, becoming real for me was when I realized just you working on you is a whole world within itself. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's massive. Yeah. It's massive. It's massive. Just you and your relationship with yourself. That is a whole world. And in really nurturing that relationship with self, that's where there will become a natural expansion to you know your relationships your close and intimate relationships and then to the world but i feel like when you're trying to do it the other way around um perhaps you're and i'll say for my own you know I'll, i'll speak for my own self i think that there was an aspect of me trying to find trying to find a sense of worthiness and a sense of like selfness and who i am through trying to change the world And when I put the world down and said, let me just be in my relationship with myself and figure that out first, um, that I have felt a lot more grounded. And I think that the way that I show up makes more sense for me and I hope does more good than causes harm. Um, But it's that discipline, right, of returning to self because we want to go outside of ourselves so often and not stay with ourselves. What I found for myself is that it was hard being with those parts of myself that I judged as yeah. not good, as not right. Um, speak to us about why that is important for us first in our relationship with ourselves, but also when we're talking about collective liberation. You know, honestly, it's so funny because a lot of life feels like a paradox mm-hmm. and it's similar for personal transformation. If it's one thing to be aware of judging yourself, but you really have to come to terms with the reality that human life is sort of built on imperfection, right? So like, even you can get it right nine times, but there's going to be that one time you're going to, you're just going to get it wrong. And, and that's just a very common aspect, but at the same time, you don't want to then build a defeatist attitude. Like, you know, because I'm so imperfect, like I'm not just not going to do anything you know, and I'm not going to try to change myself at all. And I'm just going to be stagnant. But, you know, personally, like one of the biggest things that I've been working on in 2021 is like, I I heard this story from, from a teacher that I look up to. He was telling me about one of his friends. Um, He's a, he's a, he he teaches meditation in the same tradition that I practice in. Mm. Um, He was saying that a friend of his went to an, an older teacher who he, you know, he asked him, like, how can I make progress? And the teacher told him, just accept, like, just accept, like, whatever comes up, just accept it. You know, when you're in there, and you're meditating, like, so many things can come up. But when we come into trouble, or end up like developing blocks is when something comes up, and we just kind of deal with it with tension, Mm -hmm. as opposed to just letting it be what it is. Mm -hmm. you know, and then keep moving through your practice as, as you're supposed to. But, but, um, the moment that we're fighting ourselves, we're losing, you know, we're still at, we're still at war with ourselves. We're still at war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering, you know, your journey has been with meditation. You are a deep meditator. It's a, it's a daily practice for you. Is that, is that the tool that you think everybody should use? Um, I'm asking because I was thinking (laughs) about our conversation yesterday. I was in the shower, you know, that's when you have all these thoughts, right? So I was thinking about the conversation that we were going to have today and why I personally have a sort of on again, off again relationship with meditation. Um, Mm -hmm. But the place where I, the the place where I feel like I'm authentically able to show up in that self-reflective process is in journaling wonderful and and so wondering yeah yeah, like it does it have to be meditation or is it just about finding the tool that works for you that's I mean that's it right there I think what I like I let people know that I'm a meditator um 
but really my, like the task that I've given myself and the way that I try to serve in the world is just by creating reflective material mm. because anyone, anyone can benefit from reflection, right. To just like try to get them to know themselves a little better, even at the intellectual level. Yeah. Um, but I do let people know that I'm a meditator because like, you know, the same way my friend let me know that he meditated, that really benefited me. So who knows that'll, you know, if that'll connect a spark in, within somebody right. else. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like people are in such different places, yeah. right? We all have such different emotional histories. Like the, you and I, we're talking right now, but we have gone through such immensely different journeys to get here. Yes. And what you've accumulated in your mind is different from what, what I've accumulated in my mind. So the way that we react, the intensities of our reactions, the, you know, the past that tries to repeat itself in our present, it, j- it just shows up really differently. And then there are a lot of people who have suffered incredibly intense traumas. And if their trauma is so severe, then obviously they're going to need a very gentle method to develop introspection. Because if they, you know, do something that's, that's just too much, then too much will come up and they're just not going to want to continue with the process. That's right. So for each individual, they're going to need to find something. What I try to tell people is you're going to want to find something that will be challenging, but is not overwhelming. You want to find that sweet spot, that Mm -hmm. sweet spot where like, yes, this is harder and I can put effort into this, but it's not bringing so much up that I feel like I I, I can't, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And not only that, finding something where it's challenging but not overwhelming, but you want to find something that just clicks with your intuition. That's something that um, you want to give your time, time to, and will, you know, and something that will give you results where you're seeing like, Oh yeah, I'm making better decisions. This is great for me. Yeah. Um, But to me, like, you know, what matters most is that you put your effort into taking at least a few steps forward in this life, Mm because those few steps forward, that will help us build a better world That's if right. everybody takes a few steps forward. Oh, I love that so much. I love that. Um, I want to um, read a couple of your poems. Sure. Um, I feel like everyone knows who you are, but if they don't, they should. <laughs> For those who don't, I just want to read a couple. And I had saved, um, okay, so I'm going to read like a couple of the short ones, but then I'd also um, folded the page on some of the longer ones that just spoke to me. And I will say, Diego, as I was reading through your books, you know, I, the the words are very sparse on the page, but they make you think. And so I would read, and it's like a four sentence poem, but I would read it and I would be (laughs) like, huh. And then I would read it and reread it and reread it. And I'm like, oh, this has layers. Um, So I love, I love, I love that. I love that you've done that. Um, And I, I also love that there are these longer pages as well for deeper self-reflection. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. This one's called Rebirth. This is inward first. Uh, rebirth. The moment people wake up to their power and start moving toward their freedom. I love that. So rebirth, the definition of rebirth is the moment people wake up to their power and start moving toward their freedom. What does it mean to you to wake up to your power? What does that mean? It's interesting. A lot, I, think, I think a lot of times in life we end up, and I think you hit at this a little bit earlier too, like we, we try to just externalize everything. Mm. Um, and there are these moments, especially if a great transformation is on the horizon, it will involve you being like, okay, enough is enough. You know, I, I have to put my foot down and I'm gonna move in this direction no matter what, and nobody's going to stop me. Mm. And those are the, those are those moments with like profound moments of rebirth where you're like, just taking your power back. And though we all have very different situations and there, there are difficulties at different levels, there are those moments where we're just like, okay, like I'm going to make a change within myself or, or outside of myself. And I'm going to do it no matter what. But I think, you know, it looks different for different people. Um, The moments of rebirth, the moments of reclaiming our power, but it's that moment where you're like, nope, you know, no, no, no more of this, or you give yourself a profound yes, but it's those moments where you kind of, you kind of break from the, just like the regular movement of life. The, yeah. I, and there's such power as well in seeing yourself commit to something and actually do it. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Um, another one. I started speaking my truth when being free became more important than guarding the fear of my ego. What is the ego and what are some of the misconceptions about it? And what do you think it means to have a healthy relationship with the ego? That's, that's, that's a great question. I think, um, our ego is like the, it's kind of, it's like the entirety of your sense of self. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's especially on the conventional level of like you and I conversing this moment. So like, not only is it like all of your memories and all of your conditioning, all of your, the way that you react, just all of this energy that you're carrying. Um, and not only that, but like everything that you've learned in life, it all sort of composes and becomes this like, not only definitive way that you protect yourself, mm. but the way that you like perceive and interact with the world. Mm. Um, but a lot of times the ego is like cemented on this foundation of, of survival, you know, like the, the ego emerged evolutionarily, like we're like, literally, we forget that, you know, we're sort of like, trying our best to like, procreate and, and live and eat and do these like fundamental human things that, um, you know, that in a lot of ways are motivated by fear. Um, so I think having a healthy relationship with your ego is understanding that you don't want all of your actions to be emerging from fear. Mm. Um, because a lot of times then you're just going to get like these kind of like mundane results, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to connect with people deeply, you're not going to be able to like, really reach your highest goals. But at the same time, you don't want to completely ignore fear because you don't want to become reckless, right? right? You, you, you want to understand that, right, sometimes you should be cautious. So having that healthy balance between, you know, fearlessness and, and recklessness, you want to be able to balance that and just, you know, uh, act in a way that you can preserve yourself, but also be courageous at different times. It is such a balancing act, right? Because yeah. I think for a long time, a lot of the conversation was about the ego being this thing that we need to get rid of, to minimize, to, you know, it's bad. We don't want to have ego. If we don't have ego, we don't have a self. We're not, we're not here. We don't exist. Right. Um, in, in the sort of the way that we perceive each other as two physical beings here. Um, but it can kind of swing too far the other way, I think as well. Right. Which is what I think you're trying to say. Definitely. And yeah. it, and it's, it becomes quite interesting too, because if it depends on your personal goals, like, you know, some people have a goal to have a healthy ego, which is a fine goal. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to balance things out and not be so self-centered, which is a very dangerous game to play. Yeah. Um, you know, just allowing self-centeredness to run a month. Um, but then there are other people who, you know, people who are really serious about meditation and, and like the liberational path, like where you understand where you have to balance out the conventional truth that, yeah, I'm here and I'm living my life and have responsibilities. But then you balance that out with the ultimate truth that like, no, I don't really exist. Like right. this isn't this, <laughs> this, this, like this thing right here is not really real. Like it's right. just mental and physical phenomena moving really rapidly in different combinations. And, and if becomes, I like that becomes really real <laughs> when you start learning about quantum physics, right? And how, totally, <laughs> how we're more totally. how we're more nothing than we are a thing, right? It's just oh it yeah, it's, your you're, mind. you're full of nothingness, mm -hmm. and and that's a very liberating understanding to like mm -hmm. actually you know to be able to experience that within your with your body. Yeah. Um, but but you have to balance those things out because even if you understand that like ultimate truth really deeply, you still have to like feed your dog. And right. like, you know, and, and take out your trash. So <laughs> right, right. balance, balance is key. Balance is key. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to read one of the longer ones. Um, bear with me. I just, I felt it was so beautiful that I wanted to share it. We live in a unique time when fear driven and hateful emotions are coming to the surface so that they can be completely released so that we can create a new world where institutionalized forms of harm are no longer factors in our lives. As it works for the individual, it also works for the collective of humanity. We can't heal what is ignored, nor can we live happily and freely if we continue running away from our own darkness. Personally, my faith is in people. Our courage to turn inward in the hope of uncovering and releasing all that stands in our way of becoming beings of unconditional love is what will bring harmony and peace to our world. Unity with those around us is most possible when we become internally whole and loving. 
wisdom more easily flows through us when our minds and hearts are no longer reacting to the suffering of everyday life. This does not mean that we will become cold or distant. It means that we will learn to respond calmly to the inev inevitable changes of life without causing ourselves misery. We will learn to respond to life as opposed to blindly reacting to it. Humans affect one another deeply in ways that the world at large is just beginning to understand. When we begin healing, oursel healing ourselves, it sets off waves that connect us to those who have healed in the past and those who will heal in the future. When we heal ourselves, it gives strength to those who need more support to take on their own personal healing journey. What we do reverberates through time and space, like a rock thrown into a lake, the circles it creates move in all directions. I loved that. I love <laughs> that because it spoke so deeply to my own personal philosophies around being a good ancestor and mm -hmm. knowing deeply that yes, we may be an individual self, an ego, a, a, an individual being, but we are all connected, not just in this lifetime, but in the generations that have passed and the generations that will come. And knowing that the work that we're doing now will deeply affect both th throughout time, I believe, um, forwards and backwards, right? Because it time is also a, a construct, right? So it's, it's all right, at the right. same time. Um, yeah. Can you speak on that one a bit and, and <laughs> what that means to you? Because it, it just, I, I read it and I reread it and reread it. And I was like, this is beautiful. This is it. Thanks so much for reading that one. I, I haven't read that one in a while. Um, and I also haven't posted that one in a long time either. Mm -hmm. You got to so go post nice. that one. <laughs> yeah. It's nice. It's nice to hear that one again. Cause that's very like, um, I mean, it has a lot in there. There's a lot to like kind, yes. of, kind of pick apart. Yes. Um, I love that but, you said uh, my faith is in people. Oh yeah, all day, all day. I've seen people just do amazing things when they come together. I mean, I've been a, I've been at enough rallies and enough part of enough like campaigns, different organizing campaigns, and I've been a in a part of a lot of groups that have won. You know, that have mm. won campaigns that have like literally changed their material realities in their cities, and. Um, like I know what people can accomplish. Um, yeah. But people historically have accomplished so much, you know? And what's interesting is that when you get a group of people together, like there are chances that they'll win, but will the win be lasting? Will they actually be able to create transformative change that's better for all people? And one thing that I've seen historically is that if we don't deal with ourselves internally in a way that's very healing and regenerative and helps us just become the better version of ourselves that we really want to be, mm. um, then it's just going to be so, so easy to like replicate, reproduce the harm that we were trying to fight in the beginning. Um, mm. So to me, it's like, you do want to do enough work to start activating at least some degree of unconditional love because unconditional love comes in layers. Like it's, it can be, you know, as powerful as like, you know, the great, like the great saints of the past, like people like mm -hmm. Jesus or the Buddha or mm -hmm. like, you know, Muhammad or like, you mm -hmm. know, the, the people that we all look up to. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's, that's some high level stuff. But if you're able to like, take a few steps right. in that direction, <laughs> right, that will, that will help tremendously to even right. start building a mindset of unconditional love where you, yes, I have not met this person before. But now today I'm interacting with them and you know what, still I'm going to treat them with kindness and I will do my utmost to not harm them. You mm -hmm. know, that to, to be able to like move through life with that type of mentality is going to like save us from so much harm. Right. Um, but I think it's, 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 it's powerful that when you do do that healing work, and I don't know if you've had this experience, but I've, I've had it a number of times where like I, I meditate by myself you know, um, I like, I, so this morning I meditated by myself because my wife is at a meditation retreat. Um, normally I don't meditate with myself. I meditate with her. Mm. And lately we've had two, two other friends, another couple, um, who've been staying with us. And the four of us have been meditating together. Wow. 
when the four of us meditate together, it's mad strong. It's uh, super strong. Yeah. When her and I meditate together, it's also strong. When I meditate by myself, it's strong, but it's not as strong as when I do it with a group of people. Or when I go to a meditation retreat and I meditate with like 100 or 140 mm. people, it is so powerful, so powerful. You know, like you're, you're, you get so much more work done when you're in a group. Yeah. And, and, and in a just, group that is trying to do the same, coming from the same place of intention. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Same yeah. technique. We're mm -hmm. all here for the same mission. We're all here trying to purify our minds, become mm -hmm. a better version of ourselves. And, and you know what, it's, it's interesting because the, it does feel like the energy of the past is supporting you because people have done this before. Like the, yes. even in the tradition that, that I'm a part of, like, like people have been doing this for hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. when we practice meta, this one practice, when you share your merits, they're like, may all beings be happy. Like may all beings. And you, sometimes I'll even like have the intention, like may anyone who comes like after me, may they also benefit from my merits and may they also share in my peace, my harmony, whatever good I may have acquired in this lifetime, like may they benefit from that as well. That's and beautiful. I'm not the only one who said that, you know, I'm sure people came before me who said that too. Oh, I love that so much. Thank you, Diego. Um, th so there's, there's so many things I want to ask you. <laughs> one is about, you've mentioned a couple of times your wife and um, the mm -hmm. fact that you've been in this relationship for a very long time. So a huge part of your personal journey, she's been right there alongside with you. Um, yep. And a lot of your poems are about intimate relationships and having that partner who, you know, can be there by your side, but who, you know, is that you're going to be in a real relationship with. And what does that look like? And what does that mean? And what it means like when you grow together, but you're growing at different paces or different, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So can you speak to <clears throat> us about that? Because that, I mean, relationships within themselves that's a whole that's a whole that's a school that you go to right 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 because <laughs> that person holds up that mirror for you and shows you all the things that you don't you know necessarily want to see about yourself um but I find it fascinating that you have been together for that long and have been on that journey together yeah it's been a while I'm so I'm 33 now and my wife and I we met when she was 18 and I was 19 wow so that's like that's like 12 yeah that's your years. life right that's your yeah, adult yeah. life we, yeah we we like we grew up together you know <laughs> in like in like um in a very real way we spent a third of our lives together and um so it was interesting when we when we first got together we like we felt a very strong connection to each other and it really felt otherworldly and it felt like we belonged together like we, we should be together even though it was so hard at times mm -hmm. um and I would say for the first like six years of our relationship it was really hard because you know I didn't know myself she didn't know herself and it almost at times felt like we were like in this little hurricane together mm -hmm. and um it wasn't until we started really intentionally trying to grow and then we started meditating when more harmony entered our relationship mm. and as we kept learning we started realizing what we were lacking and we you know we didn't have good communication we didn't take proper turns speaking like I you know we started learning how to listen to each other's truth selflessly and to you know to be able to like really take in her perspective or her to be able to take in my perspective without projecting anything onto it and we also didn't understand how often we were projecting or how, mm -hmm. how much, you know, we needed to be aware of ourselves yeah. to be able to maintain the harmony in our relationship. One of my favorite things to mention is like, once we really started doing this work, um, my wife was really the one who started doing this, but she, she would come home and she would let me know exactly how she felt. And like, and just so that I would know that if she felt rough, it had nothing to do with me. Oh. You know, she just didn't feel that good. And before it would become like a, like a tension point where it was like, Oh, did I do something bad or what's going on? Like, why don't you feel good? And just like dropping this idea of like, you know, you should always feel great. Like, no, oh, of course yeah. not. You know, mm -hmm. like that's so like, 
I, if I love you and I'm committing to be with you, then I should accept you in all the ways that you come, you know, and whether that's low energy, high energy, mid energy, whatever it is, like we're moving through life together. Yeah. And, um, and we really, it took a lot of time to build all these systems to just like let each other know where we're at. And my, my wife, she's so funny. She like, um, and she's been, you know, she, so we, we started meditating at the same, uh, sort of the same time she started, she did her first course, like a few months after I did mine. And, um, so she has a really powerful degree of self-awareness and she was letting me know and it cracked me up. She, one day, you know, and this happens sometimes when you're, when you're a pretty serious meditator and you're meditating like two hours a day, you are in a constant deconditioning process where mm-hmm. you're like constantly trying to just like unfurl all the layers and unbind everything that's knotted up so that you can just keep working towards that inner liberation that we're talking about. Um, but sometimes that comes with like a storm or two, yes. or you'll, you're like, you'll feel like, oof, yes. like that, this was this old pain that I've been carrying. So one day she's feeling a bit stormy and then she is like really quiet. And then a few hours later, she's like, she's like, you know, I just spent the last few hours trying to figure out how this thing that I'm feeling is your fault. And she was like, (laughs) and she was laughing to herself by like how crazy her mind was being because like, in that situation, like, and totally, sometimes things are totally my fault. You know, it's fine. But in that situation, it was not, it was, it was just her and her mind trying to work magic and figure Mm. out like, how can I blame this on him? Right. (laughs) How is this not on me? It's on him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it's just wonderful. Like I, um, I, f- I feel really fortunate to be with someone who has a high degree of self-awareness mm-hmm. and, and, you know, we still like, we, we both, we make mistakes, we miscommunicate, but it's um, what's really helped our relationship a lot is that um, meditating does decrease that level of the intensity of the reaction, you know? So like mm-hmm. when you feel tough and you want to feel angry or you want to feel you know, you can, you, you do, you feel it, you honor the fact, whatever it is that you're feeling, but you also have a bit more space in your mind to be like, mm, I'm feeling this, but you know what, I'm going to make sure to not to, to be kind to myself and to also tread gently so that I don't cause any unnecessary like arguments or unnecessary like tension around me. Mm-hmm. Um, and- you know, something, some, thank you so much for sharing, for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, not everyone has a relationship where they are engaging in a healing process and their partner is also engaging in a healing Mm -hmm. process. And I know that can be very painful for people because you feel like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working on myself, I'm doing this work and I'm trying to change myself and and they are not. Um, For me personally, I don't think that necessarily means that, you know, the, the, the relationship is not good or it's, it's doomed no, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm wondering, do, do people ever approach you with that question and how you, how do you respond to that? When one partner is yeah. not is unable just, to do the work. Mm-hmm. And isn't interested yeah, no. in doing the work mm-hmm. and sort of they're feeling like, what do I do? <clears throat> I think, um, you know, I kind of fall back into my own, my own experience. So like when I decided to start meditating two hours a day, uh, my wife was really busy at the time and she, you know, she's a scientist, so she has a lot of work to do. And, um, I decided, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this no matter what, because I know that this is just like all around the best investment that I could make in myself. Mm. And, and I want to be able to, you know, show up better in my life. Right. Um, yeah, nothing bad can come from deciding to meditate every day, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> she she initially, um, like, she didn't try to stop me or anything, but she didn't join me in it. And um, even though she had done a few courses, she, you know, was moving at her own pace. Yeah. And, and I, I think that was something that I had to learn how to honor was like, you know, just because I'm doing it or I'm, I'm moving at this pace doesn't mean that everybody else needs to be doing that. Not at all. You know, like you move at the level that is good for you to achieve your personal aspirations. Cause even your aspirations may not necessarily be my own. That's right. So it took a, it took a, um, you know, a bit of strong determination on my part to just like keep doing it alone for a Mm -hmm. number of months. And then eventually, 
she joined and mm. she decided, you know, on her own, she was like, you know what, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, become part of this. And, and then there was another interesting point where she was ready to stop drinking alcohol before I was. Mm. And she was like, you know what, like, I'm done with this. And, um, and then for me, I was like, oh, like, I'm almost done with it. Like, I'm, you know, I've almost, but it was, I was a little slower mm. with that. But, you know, I was able to, you know, even though it was hard, I was able to like, you know, honor where she was at. Mm. And then I, I, you know, went through my own process. And then um, I was able to eventually join her. But I think, you know, realizing that if, if your partner really is just not open to introspection, then you have to have the strong determination to keep going, mm. you know, because at some point or another, that will give them some sort of inspiration um, to, to possibly take it upon themselves. And if that never happens, then at least you will benefit from your own growth. And That's that right. growth will support some harmony in your relationship for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I love what you shared about, you know, your, your wife, yourself and your wife's different journeys, because it's really about doing it for yourself, right. As opposed to trying to manipulate the person that you're in a relationship yeah. with, right. To be in yeah, it with yeah. you in order to, for you to feel like, you know, I'm going to continue on it. It's, it's for me. Um, and my journey is for me and your journey is for you. And it, it is beautiful when you're synced up in that way and you're sort of walking it together. Um, but th th that's not the reality for everyone. But it, it really is about this is a gift that I'm giving to myself. This is this is work that I'm doing for myself. Um, and that in doing it, that I will show up better in the world, right, to other people. You know, I got to tell you, I love when you um, share pictures of you and your husband. No, every time really? I see, every, yeah every time I see them I'm like oh they're so great together like, we I are hope, very I different to... people you would yeah we laugh about it constantly because <laughs> we always say you know the only thing we really we only have two things in common really which is that we love each other deeply mm. and um we have very similar values um but other than that, it's a, we are night and day. We're <laughs> completely different. Mm -hmm. And I know for myself, you know, I had to release this idea of he should do this or he should be doing that because I'm yeah. doing this. what's in, we're set very differently. I am, as you had described yourself at the beginning, you know, carrying this sort of, um, what did you say? Uh, quiet sadness that you'd carried that mm -hmm. a lot. I carried that a lot as well. My husband doesn't, it's not a part of his makeup. <laughs> you know what I mean? so yeah yeah we're very very different um okay so as as we wrap up the, the one thing um that I wanted to talk about is you know you have a, a huge platform on Instagram of more than two million people but you are a very you're very focused on not um you want your work to be separate from you Diego Mm -hmm. right like young Pueblo is young Pueblo Diego is Diego and I love that you've done that I think that's so healthy that you've done that um, especially in the social media mm -hmm. frenzy that we have you know um, how how it, how has it been for you or what is the balancing act for you in showing up in the work having it reach so many people's eyes and so many people's hearts and still protecting your own peace and your own, mm, like, I've, I think I heard you say in one interview, and I think it's from one of your poems, you talked about this idea of a, a palace of peace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? So how do you protect that palace of peace <clears throat> when more than 2 million people <laughs> are following you on Instagram? <laughs> it's, it's really an ongoing situation, I think. Um, I try to build like some, I guess, like systems or like habits to try to, you know, just deal with it all in a healthy manner. I think mm -hmm. as soon as it really started becoming bigger, um, I realized I was like, oh, I was like this, if I read everything, there's going to be a whether problem. It's, <laughs> yeah, if I read everything and whether and I, and I would even say like, yeah, of course, occasionally you get like, um, you know, trolls or mean comments and stuff but even reading all the positive things yes right like it's not healthy no you know it's like well, there's it is you, not. You, you don't you don't have a situation where it's like a ratio of one to a million no. and then 
And then like 95% of them are saying, you know, really positive things and how you're inspiring them and all this stuff. So I realized I was like, oh, actually I needed to like pump the brakes and not read all this stuff because that's, that's not good for my mind Mm -hmm. or, you know, being on the internet all the time. So like I have made, you know, I, I don't respond to, I generally don't respond to DMs. I don't, um, really try to read the comments too much because it just, it's just too much. It's just, it's not good for the, for the mind. Um, and I did create young Pueblo, um, at first because I, you know, I had that idea and I was like, oh, this, this, this name fits the idea, right. It's Mm -hmm. within every, may everything that I write, hopefully be in service of the maturation of humanity. Mm -hmm. Um, but then luckily young Pueblo is like becoming its own thing. (laughs) And, and, um, I'm able to, just quietly be in the background and share the material that I'm writing. So, you know, I have a lot of followers, but nobody's recognized me in the supermarket yet. Right. So <laughs> that, that's also one of the great things about being a writer yeah. is that you're famous, but you're not, right? So <laughs> Yeah. You're known on the internet, not on the streets, right? <laughs> exactly. And you know what? I really like that. Because I like it I, too. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather keep it that way because mm-hmm. when I'm just moving through the aisles of the supermarket, it's it's better if it's just me and my wife. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. But I, I love what, what you said about um that it's not just about reading the negative comments, it's also about reading the, the positive ones and not internalizing any of them. Um, totally. And if yeah. you have like you have a huge platform too. So mm-hmm. it, because you have a huge platform, obviously most of those comments are going to be super positive because you're doing something amazing in this world but like think about that like how many compliments are you getting every day like right that's crazy right yeah. it, it's uh yeah it's not healthy um and and it, yeah. each time you know uh, there have been waves of sort of having an influx of people come in and actually what I do is go in is go inward <laughs> <laughs> when that happens, I kind of like, oh, need to hop offline, you know, and sort of recalibrate so that I am yeah. not shifting myself in some way to perform who I think I now have to be for this increased number of people. Um, yeah. But I thought about that for you because I was um, on the internet, on the sorry, on the Instagram Explore page, and one of your poems com- came up, but it was a um, was a celebrity who had shared it, mm. and you know, I was like, I mean, of course, because he has so many, um, so many followers and his work is reaching so many people. Um, And I wonder how he navigates not getting hooked into, you know, this happened or that happened. Like we can appreciate that those things are happening, but not start to define ourselves by them. Oh yeah, totally. I, um, I think, and I gotta be honest, sometimes I'm still like a little starstruck. Like I remember, um like Jennifer Lopez shared something that I put up one time and I was like oh wow like that's yeah. that's you know really big and SZA also shared something of mine and I was like wow that's that's really big but um but then at the same time it's like I don't try to like seek these things out like if, right. if I end up if I end up finding out and like one of my friends sees it and then they text it it's like amazing you know like mm-hmm. I, to me I like, I am really glad that what I'm writing is serving people, you know, like yes. if, if you're fine, if you're finding it useful, like that's literally the whole point. That's not, that's you know, right. <laughs> that, that's why, that's why I keep going right. and I don't stop because I'm trying to just like serve people well. Um, and I love the Instagram platform because it just lets me give tons of stuff away for free. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just like, literally, you know, I'll write something, nobody, you know, I get to own it and and I get to just give it away for free. And then possibly I'll put it in a book in the future, you know, right. um, inter interspersed with like a bunch of new stuff that hasn't been released, but it's, it's just like, um, it's a whole new world, you know, all this, like having all this, like, uh, in internet real estate, it's yeah. really <laughs> interesting. Like, I don't, I don't even know what to call it, you know, just having right. these massive audiences, but mm. I'm, I'm also glad that you know, there are so many people who are like, who to think just like the two of us who are like trying to do their best, transform themselves and then show up in big yeah. ways for the world. Because I mean, we, we collectively need to transform. That's right. Oh my gosh, Diego, I've loved this conversation so much. And before I ask you my final question, I just want to 
to say thank you again um, for the work that you do, for the way that you show up in the world. Um, you're such a huge inspiration to me and to our team. And I know to so many of our listeners, I want to really encourage people to get both books. These are books that I feel like you can pick up at any time and flip to any page in them and be able to really sit with the words. Um, and I also just want to honor you for doing the work within yourself continuously so that you can show up for the rest of us in this way. Again, it's such a model for all of us about the importance of being committed to that change that comes from the inside out, right? That long-term transformative change that comes from the inside out. And in a world where things are moving so fast and so much is about a performance, um, I am so inspired by you because I, I, you are the opposite of that to me. Um, and so thank you so much. Thank you so much too. And I honestly could just say all the same exact things about you. It's just been such a joy seeing your journey, seeing your success, seeing you at the, the top of the bestsellers list. And I've just been so inspired by what you're doing. And I feel Thank like you. you're literally serving so many people well, and people will tell me that they're reading your book. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I've been on I, I've been on that before you were on that. Like I've been following her for a long time. <laughs> I love that. Thanks, Diego. Yeah, <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. All right. Our final question. Um, what does it mean to you to be a good ancestor? <clears throat> um, that's such a deep question. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I hope that I'm able to live a life that really inspires um my family members and the ones who come in the future to be able to walk both lines, to not only be able to develop like a really strong mental health, but at the same time, take on the deep healing initiative, you know, to, to deeply go inward and heal themselves. Because even if you haven't experienced a lot of trauma, mm. like there's going to be, you know, you can be happier. Like you can have less, less anxiety. You can have like, you know, less intense reactions. So you could, definitely make a big change in yourself, no matter what, like no matter where you are in life. Um, but I really hope to inspire the people who come after me and the people who are with me now to just, just do the work on both levels, you know, to go inward. And then when the world calls for it, show up, like, you know, go to that protest, not just on the internet, don't just post, like, <laughs> take, go, go outside, you know, go outside. And like, when people are moving together, history changes. So go out there and move with the people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diego. Thank you too. This is Leila Saad, and you've been listening to Good Ancestor Podcast. I hope this episode has helped you find deeper answers on what being a good ancestor means to you. We'd love to have you join the Good Ancestor Podcast family over on Patreon, where subscribers get early access to new episodes, patron-only content and discussions, and special bonuses. Join us now at patreon.com forward slash good ancestor podcast. Thank you for listening and thank you for being a good ancestor.